Let them come in there. Let us find, let them find our children. Let's make sure they're safe. A demand for action to protect Texas children. How a hearing at the Capitol paved the way for new help in the crisis at Child Protective Services. First, long lines at the polls. How the record-setting turnout could affect the election in Texas. Good morning and thank you for joining us for State of Texas. I'm Josh Hinkle. Voters across the state are breaking records when it comes to the turnout at the polls. Early voting kicked off last week across Texas. That first day brought long lines and record turnout. In Travis County, the numbers kept setting records as the week went on. The county clerk is urging people to vote before Election Day to keep the wait times on that day under control. But in some parts of Texas, early voting took a lot longer than expected. Uh, about two and a half hours. Two hours and seven minutes. From the time I got here till the time I finished, uh, right at two hours and 45 minutes. Voters in the Houston area waited hours to cast their ballots Monday. Harris County also set a record for early voting turnout. In fact, each of the 10 largest counties in Texas set voting records last week. It's not quite clear which candidates benefit from the record turnout. So far, people who voted in the Republican primary are voting more than Democratic primary voters, with the GOP getting a 36 to 31 percent edge. But a report from Ryan Data and Research found nearly 10 percent of the early voters had never cast a ballot before in Texas. Nearly half of those voters registered after the March primary. So we have a close race and record turnout. For perspective on the election, we go to our roundtable. Joining us is our own Robert Hadlock, evening anchor, and our political reporter, Phil Friesen. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Are you looking forward to election night? I know it's always a long uh, one. I think we're <laughs> all looking forward to it all being over. <laughs> uh, it's been a long campaign, uh, too long. I think we need to think about changing the system here in this country. When you look at Europe, some of the other countries, uh, England, they do a snap election uh, and get it over with. I think that's healthier for the country, but uh, that's not the way we do it right now. Yeah, I know it's certainly been a lot of what we talk about on the political show, so now we're going to have to figure out how to fill some time, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, you've been doing a lot of stories about it, too. I mean, where do you think Texas is right now? We just had that new UT and Texas Tribune poll come out that said Trump is just three percentage points ahead of Hillary Clinton right now. And Democrats are taking that as saying that that's within the margin of error. Like many national outlets and political operatives are looking at Texas as a swing state this go around and that just shows how historic this election is, how crazy this has been. You know, Texas didn't go, has not gone for the Democrats since 1976 when Jimmy Carter won it. So, you know, this is a 50 year election that could happen. I think the polls are to be ignored, frankly. This election, so much is unknown. Uh, you have 70% of Americans who say this country is on the wrong track. Uh, you have Donald Trump representing uh, change. Uh, you may not like what he's saying, but he is the change agent. Uh, Hillary Clinton is, uh, you know, the Trump people would have you think that she is the uh, status quo candidate. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and the factor that uh, people call up on these polls and, and uh, with such vitriol around this election, people don't want to say who they're really going to vote for. So we're going to see how it shakes out. But I, I think uh, paying attention to the polls right now, especially as we end this election here in a, in a few days, uh, it's, it's so volatile. I don't know what's going to happen. And he has a point, in, and I remember you know, covering the New Hampshire primary where you know people did not expect Trump voters to show up until they did. And so we might have that again, like are people not saying that they support Trump publicly, but then are going to go and they're going to vote for him in big numbers come election day, which could happen. We don't know. We don't know. You know, Robert, I've seen all the file video of the past presidential elections you've covered going to the conventions and everything. So what's different about this one from a media perspective? I mean, have you seen it covered differently compared to the past? Uh, we see the social media impact with uh, the immediate feedback on everything that's going on. Uh, we see the nightly newscast. Uh, all they talk about is the polls. I mean, that's it's poll driven, and I think some of the polls that are released are to shape a public opinion about uh, how the race is going. So, uh, a lot of people are angry with the news media, especially the Trump folks who think that they're not getting a fair shake on the coverage. They're emphasizing the the gaffes that are made uh, during the day of the campaign, and uh, not enough 
talk about the issues that directly affect the American people. Yeah, I, I, I think that is definitely something that is needed. I mean, we've tried to do it here where we really get into the policies of where the candidates differ, and I think that people are not finding that on a national level at all. It's just the, the latest, this is the crazy stuff that happened today. The horse race. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I think that is, you know, when this election is over, that will be part of the autopsy report of what exactly did the media contribute and where they went wrong, where they did good. Something that's interesting about this last poll, the one I mentioned, you know, it wasn't just about who do you favor, who do you don't favor, but they asked, you know, Trump supporters and Hillary Clinton supporters separately, what's the most important issue for you when you're thinking about who's becoming president? And one of the top issues was, for both of them, the next Supreme Court justice, who's going to get to appoint that? Do you feel like that that's something that Texans really do care about, or is this just you know, beyond that? I think they care about it. I think, though, the number one issue of this every election is, it's the economy stupid. We heard Bill Clinton say that back in the 1990s and mm -hmm. nothing has changed in that regard. I think people are worried about their jobs and keeping them and they're looking at the candidates to say who's going to do best for the middle class and uh, that's always the bottom line I think. I, I agree with him but then I do there is I think a lot of attention an appropriate attention put on that you know whoever wins this election will decide the makeup of the court for the next you know 10 to 20 to 30 years. I mean, it really could be a generational shift. It's so four to four judges right now with Anthony Scalia still not replaced. You know, the next person is going to switch that to conservative or liberal leaning, and then who, you know, it will just build on onto that. So, I mean, it, it really could set the tone for the next generation of voters. Well, I'm glad you both could join us. It's a lot of fun when we can have our own on the show, right? Yeah. <laughs> you and I will be out in the field on election night, and you'll be here manning the, you'll, you'll be, you, like doing everything here, right? You got the election analysis, and you and Shannon will be bringing in all those results, and it's going to be a busy night. A lot on the plate, and we'll be here until it's all finished. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. No matter which candidate you support, election workers want to remind you to leave your guns at home. Texas law bans guns within 100 feet of a polling place. As Anna Wernicke shows us, that ban has Texans on both sides of the gun debate calling for change. That is a Wilson Combat x tac Wherever Robert Ferrego goes, so does his gun. I open carry wherever it's legal to do so. But when he goes to cast his ballot this election and exercise his First Amendment right, he says it's his Second Amendment right that's now under fire. I don't see any reason why Texans shouldn't be able to bring their guns into polling places. We gun owners are not a threat in those areas. Right now I'm standing about 100 feet from this polling location here in Austin. This is about as far as I'd be able to go if I were carrying a gun. Texas is one of six states that generally prohibits bringing guns in polling places on the day of election or while early voting is in progress. Anytime a gun is present, there is a risk. Andrea Brower with Texas Gun Sense, an anti-gun group, says saying no to packing heat at the polls is an inconsistency in Texas law. Our legislature in our state is saying that it's okay to carry um, around college kids in a, in a classroom, but um, it's not okay to carry when you vote. Brower says state lawmakers shouldn't be able to pick and choose what they consider gun-free zones, referring to the state's campus carry law that took effect in August. I know that scares and shocks some people. Robert Ferrego also hopes lawmakers revisit this issue in January. He argues that separating pistols and polls could deter some Texans from voting. There is no real history of uh, lawful law-abiding gun owners causing trouble in these places. Anna Warnicke, KXAN News. The state's open carry law took effect January 1st of this year. It allows concealed handgun license holders to carry visible holstered handguns in public with the exception of several designated gun-free zones. Polling locations are considered gun-free zones along with schools, courtrooms, and secured areas of the airport. Ahead on State of Texas, scammed by big business. Why your top defender with the state might not be much help in retrieving your money. But first, thousands of Texas children at risk. State lawmakers call for new action in the crisis at CPS. How a hearing at the Capitol led to quick action. But I'm telling you right now, we need the help. And it comes in a monetary way. We gotta make this work. It sickens me to know that there's children out there not being seen. 
The man in charge of fixing the crisis facing child protective services gets grilled by state lawmakers, and it leads to unprecedented action. Governor Abbott already ordered the Department of Family and Protective Services to hire more CPS caseworkers. DFPS head Hank Whitman revealed his plan to get it done. Total cost $53 million to hire 550 caseworkers. But when Whitman presented his plan to the Senate Finance Committee, some senators demanded immediate action. They said children in danger of abuse cannot wait. When you have uh, children that have been deemed priority one at risk for a um, high chance of immediate harm or, or abuse, then those children need to be found according to state statute that's within 24 hours. And we're failing at that. Senators told Whitman he needed a plan to find those children immediately. So during the hearing, Whitman paged Steve McCraw, head of the Texas Department of Public Safety, and asked him to help. McCraw said yes. In, in an unprecedented move, a special squad of state troopers went out across the state to look for the children. It's a daunting task. CPS says more than 2,800 children at risk of abuse had not yet been seen by caseworkers. They're supposed to be seen in 24 hours. Consumers think you are there for them. We are there for them, but we're not their lawyers. That might not be the answer you want if you expect the state to help you get back the money you've been scammed out of. Coming up, KXAN investigates other options to resolve consumer complaints. Texans with consumer complaints expecting help from the state might not be so lucky. The Attorney General's office is supposed to be the top line of defense for scam victims, but investigator Brian Collister discovered you may never get any help from that agency. Now, how do we defend ourselves from telemarketers? This is the Attorney General many Texans trust. Let's look at some tips from the Attorney General. The ultimate consumer advocate that can protect you from bad businesses. It's upsetting. Yeah, like, they're not doing their job. It's the kind of protection retired police officer Dan Irwin expected when he filed a complaint against a company called Global Escapes. Back in 2007, he agreed to pay that company more than $5,000 for a discount travel program. Maybe this might be something good where I could take my wife places, you know, we would enjoy our life together. But it turns out Global Escapes didn't save him any money. So he and other customers the turned to the Attorney General, attorney general which sued Global Escapes. The company agreed to pay a $1 million penalty and pay back $250,000 to customers. I believe the Texas Attorney General is supposed to protect the consumers. Uh, so I contacted him, made a complaint. Well, I never heard anything back. And did you ever get any money? Nothing. Not a penny. The Attorney General's own records show it does not collect most money owed to consumers, also known as court-ordered restitution. Of the more than $650 million that was supposed to be recovered for victims, the AG only collected $100 million. That's just 16 percent. And the number one uh, objective of any consumer protection law is to getting somebody who has been ripped off or deceived or uh, suffered injury in the marketplace because of a false, misleading, or deceptive act or practice, uh, getting their money back for them. Austin attorney Joe Longley should know. Decades ago, he wrote the Texas Deceptive Trade Practices Act, which created the attorney general's Consumer Protection Division. Of course, politicians love headlines, good headlines about how you're really doing your job and helping the folks. And um, over the years, though, that has sort of morphed into you get the headlines, but not necessarily the restitution and the real help that's going to help people who've been ripped off. In 2011, the AG's office went after an Austin company called Cristo Vive, which claimed to help immigrants get U.S. citizenship. I left my son when he was two years old because my father died, and I had a visa that was going to expire soon, and I decided to come to the U.S. Yadira Santos says Cristo Vive did nothing but take her money. In order to start the process for me and my son, he would need between $2,000 and $8,000. So I paid him and would continue paying him 200 every month. 
The AG's settlement with Cristo Vive's owner says they must pay 250000 back to customers, but so far they've only paid less than 35000 Santos says she hasn't gotten any of her money back. This is a robbery for me. They never helped me like they said they would. They gave me false hopes by saying they were going to help me. We do the best job that we can. Attorney David Talbot oversees the Consumer Protection Division and says his office can help consumers in different ways. And they can't recover money if a company that ripped off a consumer has shut down or gone bankrupt. A restitution is one of the... Uh, uh, objectives in terms of what we do, but I would also s say stopping uh, the particular act of practice so that future consumers would not fall prey to the same thing is also a top priority. But KXAN discovered another top priority of the AG's office is making sure it gets paid by those companies it sues. Lawsuit after lawsuit, we found the agency made sure it got its own attorney's fees even when victims got nothing. Of the 94 million in attorney's fees, the AG collected 78 million. That's 83%. Remember, it only got 16% of restitution for victims. And there's a reason for that. KXAN found as the legislature has reduced funding to the AG's office, it has become increasingly dependent on attorney's fees. From 13 million in 2000, jumping to 53 million today. It's actually got the cart before the horse, uh, you know, you really need to look and try to help the consumer uh, more than just collect some attorney's fees that go to the state. Um, yes, that does help, uh, you know, resources and payment of lawyers and state employees, which is not a bad thing necessarily, but it doesn't do the job that the Consumer Act was designed to accomplish. In cases where you're collecting the agency's attorney's fees, but not restitution, why not prioritize that and give the money to the consumers and say, here, you've been made whole? Well, it is a priority, and I would, in some instances, that might be the appropriate thing. I can't make an ironclad commitment to you that in every case that's what we're going to do because... That's well, don't you think the taxpayers, the consumers, think that's the way this agency should operate? I think they think that they want us to enforce the law, and that is something that we do. Now, topping the Attorney General's list of complaints are debt collection companies, followed by credit mortgage companies, telemarketers, landlord-tenant disputes, and Internet sales. The Attorney General can also hit a company with a financial penalty, Josh, if they find that that company has broken the law. Where does that money go? That money goes to the state's general fund, but during our investigation, we found that since 2003, only 14% of the civil penalties have been collected. All right. Thank you, Ryan. And if you have a consumer issue, you're still urged to contact the Attorney General's Consumer Protection Division. The agency says it uses that information to decide which businesses to sue and find victims. Your best chance of getting your money back is to hire a private attorney, though, to file your own lawsuit. You can also take a business to small claims court. And to find out how to start those processes, check out this story on the investigative section of KXAN.com. It's okay to check messages while you're standing in line, but put it away when, you, when it comes time to vote. It's okay to be proud to vote, but watch out how you show it. Some people are challenging laws that ban pictures in the polling place, but see why that's not changing the rules in Texas. A lot of people are proud to say they voted in this election, but there's one thing you cannot do to show that pride. You can't take a selfie at the polls. The question came up when Justin Timberlake posted this picture online telling people, no excuses, there could be early voting near you. Problem is, he took that picture in Tennessee where the law bans pictures in the polling place. He ended up taking the picture down. KXAN investigator Kevin Schwaller looks at the rules in Texas and why courts in other states are weighing in on the ballot selfie question. You really don't know what to expect, but once you get in there, the people are really nice. They want you to vote. They want to help you out. So. Alexis Andraka just cast his first ballot. For some voters, it might be tempting to capture the moment with a picture. But notice the signs. No using cell phones within 100 feet. There's actually a couple that there's no like cell phones permitted to be on. It's okay to check 
messages while you're standing in line, but put it away when you when it comes time to vote. Still, the Travis County clerk points out Texas law doesn't outline any penalties other than asking you to leave or turn off your phone. Last month, a federal appeals court panel said the ban on ballot selfies in New Hampshire is unconstitutional. But the Texas law is a bit different. It's broad, saying you can't use any wireless or recording devices. Just last session, Dave Avois says the state legislature talked about whether it needed to update the law for cell phones, but they kept the ban. After that, she doesn't see the court ruling out of New Hampshire prompting changes here. Well, I don't I don't think it's going to mean anything in Texas um, because I think there's a this strong sense of protecting privacy. I think that's where Texas is going to land. Best bet if you want to follow the state law, take those pictures outside of these cones outside the polling place. Kevin Schwaller, KXN investigates. Not all states ban selfies at the polls. Here is an NBC map that shows states that allow them. The states that ban selfies at the poll are outlined in orange. Blue states are selfie friendly and the gray states are the states where the law is not clear. Thank you for joining us for State of Texas. Stay tuned for Meet the Press coming up at 9. I'm Josh Hinkle. Have a great day.